Thank you very much, Chairperson, and for the opportunity to come here this morning to present to you on what I was given a, a very broad uh, brief. Um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change presents thousands of pages in their report around evidence of climate change from past uh, to present to future. And I've been asked in the 20 or so minutes that I have in front of you to, to cover all that and uh, to go from the global scale down to the local scale here in Ireland. So I'm going to try and do that. And as I do so, I want you to bear in mind that what we mean about when we talk about climate change. When we talk about climate, we're talking about the average of weather over periods of time, typically in the order of 30 years or so. And when we talk about climate change, we're talking about changes in those average statistics. And of course, they have uh, implications for the kinds of extremes, weather conditions that we experience. And if we are to understand climate science, it's very uh, important to begin by understanding the importance of the natural greenhouse effect in giving Earth the climate that we experience. The sun is the power behind Earth's climate system. We receive radiation from uh, the sun as that reaches the top of the Earth's atmosphere and passes down through that atmosphere. Uh, some of it is reflected, and only about half of that energy reaches the surface where it is absorbed by the Earth's surface. And as the Earth begins to warm, it too begins to emit radiation at a, a longer wavelength. And that radiation interacts with gases that occur within the atmosphere, greenhouse gases in particular. And those greenhouse gases account for approximately about 0.1% by volume of the entire atmosphere. They are there in trace amounts, but they have a very important influence on our global climate. They absorb that long wave radiation and they re-emit it into the lower atmosphere, increasing our background temperatures. And it's critical to understand how important those, those trace amount of gases under natural conditions are. If we didn't have the greenhouse gases, Earth would have a, an average temperature of approximately minus 18 degrees Celsius. That's patently not the case. So these greenhouse gases have an important role to play in raising our average temperatures by about 33 degrees Celsius under natural conditions. And our understanding of this greenhouse effect is long established. Going back to 1827, French scientist Jean-Baptiste Fourier was uh, first to recognize the warming effect of greenhouse gases, and he was the first to coin the analogy between this process and that of the, the greenhouse uh, effect. And of course, we have a, a strong Irish presence in the history of climate science. The Irish scientist John Tyndall was first to, to measure the absorption of infrared radiation <coughs> by carbon dioxide and water vapor in the atmosphere. When it comes to understand concerns about climate change at present, we really need to look at how humans, particularly human activity since the Industrial Revolution, and primarily the burning of fossil fuels, have served to increase the amounts of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. This is often hard to imagine or to capture because these gases are invisible to our eye, and that's why I include on this slide in the top right-hand corner a video showing the, the emissions of carbon dioxide globally for a single year, a video produced by NASA. When we look to ice cores, cores taken from polar regions, they allow us to establish what background concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and other gases have been going back over thousands of years. And what they show to us is that in the pre-industrial conditions, the average concentrations of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide in this case, was about 280 parts per million by volume. But we have, since the Industrial Revolution, made considerable additions to those amounts. You can see here on this slide in the bottom left, the background conditions until we reach about the Industrial Revolution and see an exponential increase in carbon dioxide concentrations. Up on the top left is a very iconic figure in climate science. It's known as the Keeling Curve. It measures background concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at high precision from Mauna Loa in Hawaii. And it shows us that uh, since about 2016, we've now exceeded 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So we've gone from pre-industrial to over 400 parts per million uh, over what is a short period of time. And of course, our concern here is that that influences global temperature. And we've been able to track that over the course of the last couple of hundred years, where scientists have kept temperature records. And we can now look back and analyze how much climate has warmed over that period. This is known as the, the Earth's temperature spiral that goes from pre-industrial levels up to, up to present. And it shows, as we, as we sequence through it, how warm individual years are relative to pre-industrial temperatures. 
And you can see that recent years in particular have been exceptionally warm, well above and almost uh, over one degree Celsius above uh, those pre-industrial temperatures across all months and seasons. And we can take another look at this in a different visual way. On the left-hand side there is a plot of different uh, time series of global average temperature uh, showing temperature differences relative to the period 1961 to 1990. And we can see clearly the increase in global temperatures that have occurred. 2016 was in actual fact the warmest year that we have ever recorded globally. It followed on from a record year at the time in 2014 and in 2015. And 2017 is expected, its projection is that green line on that graph is expected to be another hot one unless we have a, a major volcanic eruption. But when we talk about global average temperatures, it is an average. And when we break that down over the surface of the Earth, we see very different differences in terms of the extents of warming. In 2016, for example, it was the land masses in northern latitudes, particularly at high latitudes, that experienced the greatest temperature extremes in 2016. And a key question to ask is how do we know that humans are the cause? And this evidence comes from multiple different sources. First of all, we can extract and, and disentangle the natural factors that affect global climate from the human contributions or the anthropogenic contributions to increases in greenhouse gases. And perhaps the best way to visualize this is from uh, an online set of animations that show how different natural factors and human factors are actually influencing global temperature change. This line on this plot are these observed changes in temperature, and we can ask the question, how have different aspects of background uh, change or natural change influenced these uh, temperatures? We know that, for example, changes in the Earth's orbit influence climate, but they can't account for the kinds of changes we've seen over these timescales. The sun's energy and output changes over cycles, but when we account for this natural factor, it doesn't come close to explaining the amount of warming we've observed. Volcanoes, when they happen, can have a cooling effect on climate. When we account for volcanoes, they can't account for the increased temperatures that we've seen. Is it all of these natural factors combined? The answer remains no. So if it's not nature, is it human ac other human activities, like deforestation? Again, can't come close to capturing the observed increases in temperature. Is it ozone pollution, which can cause warming in the lower atmosphere? The answer, again, is no. Or is it aerosol pollution from industrial activities? And then the answer is again, no. And it really is only when we account for the role of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that we come to coming close to explaining the observed warming. And when we combine these natural factors with those greenhouse gas emissions, we get a good handle on what's happening. So this is a key attribution aspect of what has driven climate change and what role humans have played in that regard. And we've seen evidence of change across the Earth's system from high up in the atmosphere to within the Earth's oceans. We've talked about increases in global temperature. We've also seen changes or increases in sea surface temperatures. The air temperatures over the ocean are increasing. Sea level rise is increasing. Summer Arctic sea ice extent is decreasing. The heat content of the oceans is increasing. With a warmer air, we expect it to hold more moisture, and the specific humidity or the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere is increasing. So the evidence from multiple sources is all consistent that humans are driving an increase in these aspects, change in the climate system. With changes in average conditions, we expect changes in extremes, and we are seeing these playing out as well from our observations. From a reduction in the number of cold nights and cold days, increases in warm nights and warm days, and summarized by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, we've seen hot days, hot nights, warm spells and heat waves increase, droughts in parts of the world like the Mediterranean and West Africa increase, heavy precipitation events increase, particularly here in the mid-latitudes. And we've seen the influence of changing climate on flood events. We've seen, for example, a change in the timing of flood events across Europe driven by changes in climate. In Ireland, we also see these changes playing out. We've done some work recently about asking how the likelihood or the probability of extremes that are within our memory have changed over the observational record in Ireland. Our driest summer was in 1995, and we've seen an eight-fold increase in the probability of a summer as dry as 1995 occurring. The summer of 1995 was also the warmest summer on record. We've seen a 50-fold increase in the probability of summers as warm as 1995 happening in our observations. 
The wettest winter on record before 2015 16 was 94 and 95. And again, we've seen an eightfold factor increase in the likelihood of a winter as wet as 94 and 95 happen. What we know is that continued emissions of greenhouse gases will cause further warming and changes to all components of the climate system. So the future that we face is very much in our hands as a global community. We can, for example, stay on a business as usual path, making no effort at reducing greenhouse gases. In that case, we follow a future climate scenario that's known as RCP 8.5. Or we can make transformative changes, deep cuts in the types of energy we use and the amounts of gases we emit to keep warming uh, within what we call a safe limit of two degrees. That blue line on that plot is represented, representing that future of RCP 2.6. And we can use our science, particularly how we integrate our science and climate models in order to project into the future what these different emission scenarios mean for our global climate. The climate models we use are very much like the weather forecast models that we use, except we run them over longer horizons to the end of the century. These are complex models, and of course there are uncertainties with predicting the future decades and towards the end of the century. But these models are able to capture the observed warming, and they capture the observed warming very well up to, this up to this point. And if we ask the question, what future do we want? One that's business as usual, or one that we make rapid reductions in greenhouse gases influences the type of future that we see. Here's maps of global temperature on your right-hand side for business as usual, and on your left-hand side for deep cuts in emissions. The business as usual results in a temperature increase of about four degrees Celsius globally. Again, that's an average. Land masses in the Northern Hemisphere and the high Arctic regions increase temperatures far in excess of that global average. In terms of what future we want, again, business as usual results in significant sea level rise. On the bottom right hand map is, a, is a, an indication of sea level rise that accounts for other adjustments that happen like land mass rebound from ice ages. And it looks at a sea level rise, uh, about uh, business as usual, of about 0.8 of a metre on average globally. And of course, that's not equally felt. Around the coast of Ireland, for example, on this map, we're looking at a uh, sea level rise of approaching the upper end of that spectrum. Our cities, major towns are all located around the coast. Those extreme events, those past events that I talked about from an Irish perspective, we can ask the question of how frequent might they become in the future. For example, a summer, that dry summer of 1995 saw implications for water resources here in Ireland. It saw problems for tourism, particularly in the Shannon around navigation. It caused problems with drought across the country. In the future, under business as usual, we expect one in eight years to be as dry as 1995. That wet winter that saw excessive flooding, and think again about the Shannon floods of a couple of years ago. Under business as usual, that happens again once in about every eight years by the end of the century. And in 1995, we saw problems in terms of increased mortality due to extreme heat conditions among the elderly and the sick. By the end of the century, we only see summers as cool as 1995, about one year in seven. So 90% of summers by the end of the century here in Ireland will be at least as warm or warmer than 1995. And we have seen in recent years, because of the extreme events, the exposures that exist here in Ireland from flooding, from a lack of investment in our water supply infrastructure to coastal exposure to sea level rise, that these are not just far out problems in other parts of the world, that Ireland has high levels of exposure. And these kind of findings have asked, have begun, scientists have asked, well, what is an acceptable level of risk? And what they find is that temperature increase that goes beyond two degrees Celsius on a global level increases the risk of not so nice things happening. And it's for those reasons that the Paris Agreement in 2015 committed the international community to limiting global warming to not more than two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial temperatures. And they made the ambitious target of trying to limit that to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Again, from observations, we're already halfway there. Beyond two degrees Celsius, we see an increased risk to unique and threatened ecosystems, globally iconic systems like coral reefs. We see the risk of extreme events increasing uh, very rapidly after two degrees Celsius. Extreme rainfall events, storms, floods, and so on. And the distribution of impacts becomes increasingly unjust as we go beyond two degrees Celsius. Carbon dioxide emissions are very much associated with fossil fuel uh, emissions and are driven by Western society and the Industrial Revolution. 
Yet the greatest vulnerability and the greatest exposure happens to be in the global south that have very little to do with this problem. So these impacts will also be felt differently. When we talk about how impacts will be felt, we talk about vulnerability to climate change. And those darker colours, those blues, represent the parts of the world that are most vulnerable. Those cities are 15 of the fastest growing cities uh, that are at extreme risk uh, from climate change, whether they're coastal locations exposed to heat and from many different factors. And that this is not a straightforward uh, prospect that those who cause the problem actually feel the problem uh, uh, more severely. So what we can conclude then is that the success of mitigation dictates the extent of future climate change. This is a snapshot in time of the end of the Paris Agreement in 2015, in the business as usual future that results in those kinds of impacts that I have just outlined is marked in that red line. The blue line that we need to get to to keep global temperatures to below two degrees Celsius is marked as that blue line. Coming out of the Paris Agreement and the intended contributions to reducing greenhouse gases that have already been signed up is the purple line. These are pledges. They have not transpired. They are not reality yet. They are just pledges. But I want to make one final and important point, that even if we are, if we are successful at holding global temperature to two degrees Celsius, climate change will still have an impact and we will need to adapt. And adapt adaptation means adjusting our systems and our society to deal with the consequences of climate change. And to illustrate that point, I want to touch on two things, one a global scale impact and the other an Irish focus. Heat stress is brought about when the human body increases temperature to the point where it has problems cooling and causes problems with sickness and ultimate, ultimately mortality. With a warming temperature and a warming globe, we also expect increases in water vapour in the atmosphere, a higher humidity. And that increases in parts of the world that feels like temperature, that influences human health. To give you an indication of what heat stress can mean for human populations, in 2015, Karachi in Pakistan experienced this record high temperatures that resulted in heat stress for many of the poorest in society, for example, in the picture up here, that resulted in thousands of deaths. On a, 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 not a lack of accessibility to uh, air conditioning, working outside, high levels of vulnerability and exposure. And what we know is that even if we maintain warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial, we are expecting to see a, a, an increased heat stress burden globally, globally. The number of days that we can count on as being heat stressed by a factor of six. That's an additional 250 million people globally at risk of deadly heat stress, even at 1.5 degrees Celsius. At two degrees Celsius, the global heat stress burden increases by a factor of 12. And if we continue as business as usual, that heat stress burden increases by a factor of 75. That is a point at which cities like New York become as heat exposed to heat stress as cities like Karachi. So in a two degree warmer world, Karachi could experience its type of 2015 type deadly heat conditions at least once every year. If we go business as usual and warming reaches four degrees, 2015 would become an every year event. Here in Ireland, research has looked at what two degrees Celsius, maintaining global temperatures at two degrees means for flooding and extreme events in Europe. And what we find is that even at two degrees, Ireland still sees an increase in, the, in flood risk. The flood we expect to occur on average once every 100 years increases in magnitude by between 10 and 30 percent. And when we talk about increased intensity of rainfall events, even at two degrees, we see increases in rainfall intensity of about 10 to 25 percent. And again, in these contexts, think of recent experiences like the Shannon floods and the Donegal floods. So finally, I want to finish by saying that climate change is real, it's happening, and the future we have in front of us is very much in our hands. And critically important that the combination of the impacts of climate change, the vulnerability that exists, both here in Ireland and globally, and the responsibility make climate change an issue of justice. In terms of distributional justice, as who suffers the most, intergenerational issues of justice, and that it's our children's future that we are considering, and procedural justice, in terms of whose voices count in informing policy and making decisions. And in that regard, this gathering and this Citizens' Assembly is extremely unique internationally of increasing that process of procedural justice. Even if mitigation is successful, we still need to adapt. So the question, of course, that you're left with is how can we make Ireland a leader in tackling climate change? Thank you.